Hello and welcome to Americans Learn. My name is Colin and today I'm watching The Secret Darker Art of Dr. Seuss. And this is coming from Solar Sands. Uh, this is a new channel for me. I've, I've never heard of Solar Sands before, so not familiar with their content, what kind of, um, I don't know, history or uh, historical figures they cover. Uh, so this is brand new. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously familiar with who Dr. Seuss is and uh, the children's books that most of us grew up with, I guess. Um, and uh, I, I know that, you know, there were some few uh, uh, illustrations or older books of his from a period that was, uh, you know, time, times are different. And uh, there were depictions that were, you know, quite racist. And uh, that I think in today's... Uh, society most of us would would recognize it as such and i think know that the uh the whoever owns the rights to all his works now uh a few years ago chose uh to remove some of them from publication i guess uh i'm sure there are probably older copies you can get elsewhere but um yeah if you're interested in that anyway um but yeah so i'm, I'm kind of interested what kind of darker art of dr seuss we're talking about here uh i mean, i'm a fan of his work his is a uh, artistic style and uh uh i had i don't know if i still have it somewhere but when i when i first moved out on my own i did get a, a like bring a copy of uh, uh i think it's called the the places you'll go one of those i think that that was called that 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 book of his it's a good one but um yeah anywho with that being said, be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and uh, let's dive right in, shall we? Theodore Seuss Geisel, a.k.a. Dr. Seuss, which originally is supposed to be pronounced Dr. <clears throat> Seuss, but I'm not going to say that because there's probably only like five people on the planet who pronounce it that way, and Geisel himself eventually switched to the anglicized version. Dr. Seuss was one of the most famous and successful children's book authors and illustrators in the world, with his books selling more than half a billion copies. And for many of us, his works produce cherished childhood memories. And while his use of language and his storytelling abilities are something to be admired, his artwork was also a memorable and integral part to his stories. Dr. Seuss's signature wacky, gravity-defying art style is unmatched in its uniqueness. And while we all know Dr. Seuss mainly for his excellent children's books, animations, and the maybe not so excellent films made after his death, there are many artworks that are not as known but still. How do you guys feel about the uh, Cat and Hat, Cat and the Hat movie with uh, um, Michael Myers? Mike Myers, I guess. Maybe I should say it Mike Myers. Michael Myers is the, you know, serial killer movie star. Anywho, uh, what what did you think of that film? I, I think I saw it when it first came out. I don't think I've ever seen it all the way through since. So it's been a long time, but I was not a fan. And I'm a big fan of The uh, the Grinch with Jim Carrey. I, and I enjoyed it then. I know a lot of people, at least of my parents' generation, didn't quite enjoy it when it first came out. But I appreciate it. I, I enjoy it. Uh, but not Cat in the Hat. So what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Still definitely worth talking about. Dr. Seuss began as a cartoonist in the 1920s for magazines and other publications, such as Life and Vanity Fair. In 1931, Dr. Seuss illustrated a book called <coughs> The Pocket Book of Boners. <clears throat> At the time, Boner <laughs> did not have the sexual... I actually think I, I had heard of this one before. It's been a long time. And yeah, I know, I know back then, Boner meant like a mistake. I think he's about to explain it here or like a goof of some kind. So yeah, the there's a n newspaper article that Joker's holding there, the Tortle at Joker's Boner. <laughs> Classic. connotation it has today, and originally meant a silly mistake. It was a humorous book full of illustrations, and was one of the best-selling paperbacks of World War II. This book was actually a collection of four books titled Boners, More Boners, Still More Boners, Prize <laughs> Boners, and then even more <laughs> compilations were released titled The Omnibus Boners and The Second Omnibus Boners. That's a lot of boners. In Hang on a second, I actually kind of, what does omnibus mean? I need, I need to look that up, just just for context. So I, I, I want to understand what omnibus means so I can accurately picture omnibus boners. So this is a very serious thing. 
Omnibus definition. A volume containing several novels or other items previously published separately. Okay. Or a bus. I think I do remember. I don't know, like Volkswagen maybe having an omnibus, perhaps. Uh, anywho, let's keep going. 1937, Ted Geisel wrote and illustrated his first children's book, And to Think I Saw It on Mulberry Street, which had lackluster sales but garnered glowing reviews because of its imaginative story and visuals. Around the 1930s, Dr. Seuss collected things like antlers and other leftovers from dead animals, which his father would send him as he worked at the Springfield Zoo. He would take these parts, combine them with paper mache and paint, mm. and transform them into busts of fictional creatures. So, um, I'm originally from Southern California and lived pretty close to, uh, Laguna Beach. And there's a Dr. Seuss museum there with a lot of his original works of art. Uh, some of them were, were these weird, uh, creatures. I, I think these two were, might, might have been in that museum. Uh, or at least things that were similar, you know. Uh, very clearly Dr. Seuss made, um, fake, uh, what do you... What do you call these? I don't know. Mounted heads thing or whatever. Or, I don't know. I'm not that much into the hunting thing or taxidermy, so I, 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 I don't know if there's like an official name other than just mounted heads. Anywho, prize heads. But yeah. They were very cool in person, is, is my point. He called the eventual 18 sculptures that would result from this process unorthodox yeah, I taxidermy. The, I think that swordfish one was uh was there i'm pretty sure the the antelope looking one was also at this museum maybe the turtle too but yeah some of my favorites have to be the goo goo eyed tasmanian yeah. wool ghast the mulberry street unicorn the sea going dilemma fish and the sawfish that one has a surprisingly normal title Later, but still pretty early in his career, he became a political cartoonist, and during World War II produced over 400 cartoons. The funny thing about these drawings is that Wait, hang on a second. What? I wanted to read that last one. Weimar, U.S. saving bonds and stamps. <laughs> Cages cost These drawings is that many of them contain creatures and caricatures that are very familiar. Remember one more lollipop and then you're all go home. Familiar to the wacky animals later seen. First Nazis. Hmm. Relatives not just three fellers going along. Seen in his right. children's books. So it gets very surreal when you see something like Horton representing the GOP and Adolf Hitler drawn in his signature whimsical style. But just to be absolutely clear, Dr. Seuss was very opposed to fascism. Bum, that's that's uh, tagging along behind. Keep your eye on the bum that's tagging along behind. I don't know why that was such a struggle for me to read. Yeah, but why wait till 1944? Is an American isolationism during World War. And the wolf chewed up the children and spit out their bones, but those were foreign children. It really didn't matter. Yeah, yeah we're. Still a familiar sentiment these days, isn't it, unfortunately? Or two, but he wasn't always on the right side of history. Especially when you highlight these two comics. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, these are, these are spicy. These are very spicy. Of course, you have to keep in mind the time period when these depictions were acceptable. And yes, he did support the Japanese internment camps at the time, but clearly his ideas changed quite a bit. Sorry, I'm not, I should probably be reading this aloud. I don't know why I'm reading it intently, but uh, Horny's Who, published in 1954, is about an elephant uh, that has to protect a speck of dust populated by little tiny people. The book's hopeful inclusion refrain, a person is a person, no matter how small, is about as far away as you can get from his ignoble words about the Japanese decade earlier. I hope so. Uh, I don't know if he's going to show more examples of, of his, uh, I don't know, change of heart. Uh, but yeah, I would hope it so. later on. These political cartoons, while interesting, are not as polished or witty as the children's books he would later write. 
Dr. Seuss's art style has remained very consistent throughout pretty much all of his career. To demonstrate this, you can take a quick glance at any of the advertisements that he illustrated and immediately recognize his signature style. Anything from Ford, to Standard Oil, to a detailed drawing of Hell for General Electric. I cannot understate how unique and recognizable Ted Geisel's art style was. His figures are simple, yet complicated. Plain and rounded droopy faces contrast with intricate cross-hatching on things like clothes and fur. His characters are very gestural and lively, and his buildings and machinery are no different. They often seem to defy gravity, and rarely contain any straight lines. The use of cross-hatching and reliance on pen and ink, along with the strategic flat colors seen in most of his books, probably comes from his experience as a cartoonist, with the goal of keeping the interest of younger audiences. And combined with the ridiculous designs of his creatures and machines, they all form an identity that is overwhelmingly and undeniably Seussian. While the rhymes, inventive made-up words, and timeless storytelling are the core of his children's books, the imagery he uses to bring that whimsical poetry into visual forms is essential to the experience of a Dr. Seuss work. And what makes this style more intriguing is when it's put into different situations, from political cartoons to taxidermy. But there is another collection of lesser-known Dr. Seuss art that I find the most interesting of them all. Dozens of paintings that Dr. Seuss made in private, and were not to be released until after his death. A collection he liked to call the Midnight Paintings. What strikes most people first about these paintings is how different they are from his mainstream works. There's a lot more black and other colors in these works, and many of them have a more ethereal quality. Clearly, these paintings were made for more emotive and leisure goals rather than storytelling ones. It's hard to summarize the many paintings he produced behind closed doors, so it's really best to approach them case by case. These secret Dr. Seuss works have a variety of styles and subjects. This painting, titled Cat Detective in the Wrong Part of Town, is reminiscent of Cubist works, but so yeah, um, some of those paintings I'm I'm pretty sure were um, also in that museum I was talking about where I, I saw some of the um, mannequin things that he made. Uh, I'm pretty sure I recognize this the one on the the left here that is mimicking mimicking cubism. Uh, I think there was one with with Horton that I I recognize, but the other ones I'm I'm not so sure those don't really stand out to me quite as much as the. Uh, the mannequins that I, I saw earlier. In the but with video. brighter colors and typical Seussian architecture. A few other paintings contain a yeah, similar one, style, for sure. but for subjects really like, like resorts. Others are more dramatic, forcing the viewer into unorthodox perspectives, like this Dutch angle view of blobs of color leaping out of a brightly colored ocean. Yeah, I really like these kinds of paintings. I like this kind of like surrealist, very vibrant color, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know, just having, having a little bit of that in your life, just up on your walls, it's really, it really brightens things up. You know? Or this drastically curved landscape that seems to extend for infinity. Some are entirely abstract. Mm. Others are more pattern-based, like this painting of dozens of working-class birds walking up and down, made to express Geisel's economic concerns. Then this painting, a plethora of cats, yeah. was made for a simple reason, to show a lot of cats but more specifically as a form of relaxation to see how many cats he could paint in. And how many are on this one canvas exactly? 392. A more satirical set of works called the La Jolla Bird Women resulted from Geisel people watching from his La Jolla Tower studio. These <laughs> thin bird folk were made to gently poke fun at his neighbors, and as you would expect, they are quite simple. They're women, but birds. The works I think are most interesting are the ones that are darker, both in color schemes and subject matter. A very simple painting titled Cat in Obsolete Shower Bath familiar. demonstrates the purely aesthetic choices of the darker paintings. The brush strokes and layering of color is erratic. There's no flat or smooth colors, just textural grungy spots forming the environment. The greenish yellow of the shower curtain is reminiscent of mold. There is speculation this is meant to represent how early in his life, Ted Geisel had to spend time in dingy one-room apartments. These overlapping gradients and textural painting is a far cry from the clean, calculated coloring of his children's books. And many of these paintings seem to represent a seedier, almost cynical aspect we didn't usually see in his art. One of my favorite paintings, Cat from the Wrong Side of the Tracks, seems to... <laughs> I think I recognize this one too. Ply just from the title, the subject is an inversion of the child-friendly cat in the hat. 
The face is more angular, his whiskers unkempt, and his aura is overall more sinister. To complement this, we get more Susian architecture but applied to a pool table, with a bunch of nonsense angles and extreme distortion. One of my favorite details is the beads above his head. Everyone knows the saying, a cat has nine lives, right? Well, let's just say that it seems eight of his beads are used up, and there seems to be just one left. A similar painting, Indistinct Cat Symbolism. with Cigar, develops a theory that these cat representations could be something of an alter ego, considering that Dr. Seuss was a lifelong smoker. And just like how he never smoked where a child might see him, these paintings too remained hidden. It's hard to find any self-portraits of his that are positive or... I, I don't know if that one was in the museum, but I've definitely seen bad picture before. It's a, it's a odd one, isn't Pleasant. it? Pleasant. One of them is quite blatantly titled, Self-Portrait of the Artist Worrying About His Next Book. So it seems to me some of these works might have been Dr. Seuss's version of vent art. Well, that's probably an oversimplification, but you get what I mean. Probably one of the creepiest, darker paintings is mm. Surly Cat Being Ejected, where this grotesquely long cat is being sent away by this almost faceless, mannequin-like woman in the dead of night. It's hard to pinpoint exactly why I find this work slightly unsettling, but I would guess it's the combination of all the uncanny and distorted elements. Of course, in contrast, there are many hopeful and bright paintings, such as this sunny seascape, full of roaring waves and the impossibly long tail of a bird being manipulated by the great swirls and fluctuations of the wind. The dynamic shapes that Geisel so masterfully produces gives this painting a great sense of energy and movement. Then there are paintings that walk a delicate middle ground between melancholy and hopefulness, such as The Great Cat Continuum, made during his later years. Dr. Seuss's cat seems to walk through an enormous line of windows from one experience to the next, each with slightly different shapes and distortions. There are a few with biblical meanings, such as this depiction of the Tower of Babel, or this cat named Joseph Katz, sporting a brightly colored outfit, clearly alluding to the story of Joseph and his brothers. But the ones that are and the Technicolor dream coat. my favorite come from a stage in the Midnight Paintings often referred to as Geisel's Deco Period, referring to the black backgrounds and golden structures. The iconic and strange, asymmetrical, slightly organic architecture is illogical, almost alien, even more so than in his books, because this time there is few basic structures to even signify something inhabitable, not even a window or roof. The only thing that is an indicator are the stairs, Stairs that seem to lead nowhere. And when you have this architecture set in front of an almost pure black background, both with a single creature resting in the middle, you get this immense sense of isolation, abandonment even. It is difficult to assume that the people who built these structures are even living there anymore. But the creatures currently relaxing in these structures are happy. They are a beacon of life and hope. And that's why with this sense of isolation, you also get this immense sense of tranquility. It almost seems like too with with these two paintings with the uh, what I'm guessing is like a kind of volcano with the the smoke rings coming out of the top uh, that this is like two different angles from the same location uh, or maybe like uh, uh, I don't know like twin cities or twin structures that are. I don't know, somewhat distance from each other? Because it does seem like, I don't know, maybe on one side of the mountain from the other, perhaps. You know what I'm saying? It kind of looks like that to me. I feel like if, if you're going to get one painting, you probably have to get the, the other one to kind of to have them match. It's my sense, anyway. If I were to get uh, copies of these for myself. Other deco paintings give off similar feelings, but not as intensely as these two. When I first heard about these secret paintings, I wanted to find some sort of code to crack. Some puzzle or hidden meaning behind these private works that could possibly unlock some of Dr. Seuss's genius, or give some magical window into the man's soul, or reveal some deep, dark secret. But of course, these paintings are a variety of things. None of them really gossip-worthy. And while they do reveal some sides to Ted Geisel that were previously unknown, they are also fun, humorous, and express his imagination just as well as in his books, but with more coloring and subject matter freedom. The many atmospheres and moods expressed in the Midnight Paintings are often different from his books, but I can say with utmost confidence, they are just as creative. Uh, wait, let's see. Fan art of the week. There you go. Fan art of the week. 
Hit me properly, peasant. Fantastic. Okay, I don't think he's got anything else to say or to promote there, so... There you go. Well, if you had never seen any of those paintings, I hope you uh, enjoyed that. There were a few there that I didn't recognize that were new. Um, but yeah, I was a, I was a, I was a pretty big fan of, of Dr. Seuss growing up and uh, uh, having lived nearby that particular gallery. Um, I'd been not. I, it's not like I went there a ton. I went there like I don't know two or three times. But um, yeah, if you ever find yourself in Laguna Beach, uh, check it out. Uh, I assume it's still there. Um, I'm not sure why it wouldn't be. Uh, I feel like I don't know, Dr. Seuss hasn't really gone out of style, right? Amongst, you know, new parents buying it for the, the, the books for their kids, right? Um, yeah, go check out that museum if you have a chance. Uh, really cool works of art. And uh, obviously, like I said, the uh, the mannequins that he made of those weird looking animals. Uh, really fun to see in person. Um Kind of like when you when you look at it, like those those mannequins, especially it, like I remember looking at them, thinking, you know, I I bet I could make something like that. That may, might be kind of a fun project to do, and maybe hang up on my wall or above my my fireplace mantle. I do have a a fireplace in my my apartment currently, um, but uh, yeah, might be kind of fun. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed watching that. Um, thanks for sticking around. And uh, be sure to like, and like, share, and subscribe. You know the deal. And uh, I'll see you next time.